Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad. Chapter 8. How long he stood stock still by the hatch, expecting every moment to feel the ship dip under his feet and the rush of water take him at the back and toss him like a chip, I cannot say. Not very long, two minutes perhaps. A couple of men he could not make out began to converse drowsily, and also, he could not tell where, he detected a curious noise of shuffling feet. Above these faint sounds there was that awful stillness preceding a catastrophe, that trying silence of the moment before the crash. Then it came into his head that perhaps he would have time to rush along and cut all the lanyards of the gripes, so that the boats would float as the ship went down. The Patna had a long bridge, and all the boats were up there, four on one side and three on the other, the smallest of them on the port side, and nearly abreast of the steering gear. He assured me, with evident anxiety to be believed, that he had been most careful to keep them ready for instant service. He knew his duty. I dare say he was a good enough mate, as far as that went. "'I always believed in being prepared for the worst,' he commented, staring anxiously in my face. I nodded my approval of the sound principle, averting my eyes before the subtle unsoundness of the man. He started unsteadily to run. He had to step over legs, avoid stumbling against the heads. Suddenly someone caught hold of his coat from below, and a distressed voice spoke under his elbow. The light of the lamp he carried in his right hand fell upon an upturned dark face, whose eyes entreated him together with the voice. He had picked up enough of the language to understand the word water, repeated several times in a tone of insistence, of prayer, almost of despair. He gave a jerk to get away, felt an arm embrace his leg. "'The beggar clung to me like a drowning man,' he said impressively. "'Water! Water! What water did he mean? What did he know?' As calmly as I could, I ordered him to let go. He was stopping me. Time was pressing. Other men began to stir. I wanted time, time to cut the boats adrift. He got hold of my hand now, and I felt that he would begin to shout. It flashed upon me it was enough to start a panic, and I hauled off with my free arm and slung the lamp in his face. The glass jingled, the light went out, but the blow made him let go, and I ran off. I wanted to get the boats. I wanted to get at the boats. He leaped after me from behind. I turned on him. He would not keep quiet. He tried to shout. I had half throttled him before I made out what he wanted. He wanted some water. Water to drink. They were on a strict allowance, you know, and he had had with him a young boy I had noticed several times. His child was sick and thirsty. He had caught sight of me as I passed by, and was begging for a little water. That's all. We were under the bridge in the dark. He kept on snatching at my wrists. There was no getting rid of him. I dashed into my berth, grabbed my water bottle, and thrust it into his hands. He vanished. I didn't find out till then how much I was in want of a drink myself. He leaned on one elbow with a hand over his eyes. I felt a creepy sensation all down my backbone. There was something peculiar in all this. The fingers of the hand that shaded his brow trembled slightly. He broke the short silence. These things happen only once to a man, and— Ah, well. When I got on the bridge at last, the beggars were getting one of the boats off the chocks. A boat! I was running up the ladder when a heavy blow fell on my shoulder, just missing my head. It didn't stop me, and the chief engineer— they had got him out of his bunk by then— raised the boat-stretcher again. Somehow I had no mind to be surprised at anything. All this seemed natural and awful and awful. I dodged that miserable maniac, lifted him off the deck as though he'd been a little child, and he started whispering in my arms, "'Don't! Don't! I thought you was one of them niggers!' I flung him away. He skidded along the bridge, 
and knocked the legs from under the little chap, the, the second. The skipper, busy about the boat, looked round and came at me head down, growling like a wild beast. I flinched no more than a stone. I was as solid standing there as this. He tapped lightly with his knuckles at the wall beside his chair. It was as though I had heard it all, seen it all, gone through it all twenty times already. I wasn't afraid of them. I drew back my fist, and he stopped short, muttering, Ah, it's you. Lend a hand, Kvik. That's what he said. Kvik. As if anybody could be quick enough. Aren't you going to do something? I asked. Yes. Clear out, he snarled over his shoulder. I don't think I understood then what he meant. The other two had picked themselves up by that time, and they rushed together to the boat. They trampled, they wheezed, they shoved, they cursed the boat, the ship, each other. Cursed me. All in mutters. I didn't move. I didn't speak. I watched the slant of the ship. She was as still as if landed on the blocks in a dry dock. Only she was like this. He held up his hand, palm under, tips of the fingers inclined downwards. Like this, he repeated. I could see the line of the horizon before me as clear as a bell above her stem head. I could see the water far off there, black and sparkling and still, still as a pond, deadly still, more still than ever a sea was before, more still than I could bear to look at. Have you watched a ship floating head down, checked in sinking by a sheet of old iron too rotten to stand being shored up? Have you? Oh, yes, shored up. I thought of that. I thought of every mortal thing. But can you shore up a bulkhead in five minutes, or in fifty, for that matter? Where was I going to get men that would go down below? And the timber! The timber! Would you have had courage to swing a maul for the first blow if you had seen that bulkhead? Don't say you would. You had not seen it. Nobody would. Hang it! To do a thing like that you must believe there is a chance, one in a thousand at least, some ghost of a chance, and you would not have believed. Nobody would have believed. You think me a cur for standing there, but what would you have done? What? You can't tell. Nobody can tell. One must have the time to, to turn round. What would you have me do? Where was the kindness in making crazy with fright all those people I could not save single-handed, that nothing could save? Look here. As true as I sit on this chair before you. He drew quick breaths at every few words, and shot quick glances at my face, as though in his anguish he were watchful of the effect. He was not speaking to me, he was only speaking before me, in a dispute with an invisible personality, an antagonistic and inseparable partner of his existence, another possessor of his soul. These were issues beyond the competency of a court of inquiry. It was a subtle and momentous quarrel as to the true essence of life, and did not want a judge. He wanted an ally, a helper, an accomplice. I felt the risk I ran of being circumvented, blinded, decoyed, bullied, perhaps, into taking a definite part in a dispute impossible of decision if one had to be fair to all the phantoms in possession, to the reputable that had its claims, and to the disreputable that had its exigencies. I can't explain to you who haven't seen him, and who hear his words only at second hand, the mixed nature of my feelings. It seemed to me I was being made to comprehend the inconceivable, and I know of nothing to compare with the discomfort of such a sensation. I was made to look at the convention that lurks in all truths, and on the essential sincerity of falsehood. He appealed to all sides at once, to the side turned perpetually to the light of day, and to that side of us which, like the other hemisphere of the moon, exists stealthily in perpetual darkness, with only a fearful ashy light falling at times on the edge. He swayed me, 
I own up to it, I own up. The occasion was obscure, insignificant, what you will, a lost youngster, one in a million. But then he was one of us. An incident as completely devoid of importance as the flooding of an ant heap, and yet the mystery of his attitude got hold of me as though he had been an individual in the forefront of his kind, as if the obscure truth involved were momentous enough to affect mankind's conception of itself. Marlowe paused to put new life into his expiring cheroot, seemed to forget all about the story, and abruptly began again. My fault, of course. One has no business, really, to get interested. It's a weakness of mine. His was of another kind. My weakness consists in not having a discriminating eye for the incidental, for the externals, no eye for the hod of the rag-picker or the fine linen of the next man. Next man, that's it. I've met so many men, he pursued with momentary sadness, Met them, too, with a certain, certain impact, let us say, like this fellow, for instance. And in each case all I could see was merely the human being, a confounded democratic quality of vision which may be better than total blindness, but has been of no advantage to me, I can assure you. Men expect one to take into account their fine linen, but I never could get up any enthusiasm about these things. Oh, it's a failing. It's a failing. And then comes a soft evening, a lot of men too indolent for whist, and a story. He paused again to wait for an encouraging remark, perhaps, but nobody spoke. Only the host, as if reluctantly performing a duty, murmured, You are so subtle, Marlowe. Who? I? said Marlowe in a low voice. Oh, no! But he was! And try as I may for the success of this yarn, I am missing innumerable shades. They were so fine, so difficult to render in colorless words, because he complicated matters by being so simple, too, the simplest poor devil. By Jove, he was amazing! There he sat, telling me that just as I saw him before my eyes, he wouldn't be afraid to face anything, and believing it, too. I tell you, it was fabulously innocent, and it was enormous, enormous. I watched him covertly, just as though I had suspected him of an intention to take a jolly good rise out of me. He was confident that, on the square, on the square, mind, there was nothing he couldn't meet ever since he had been so high, quite a little chap, he had been preparing himself for all the difficulties that can beset one on land and water. He confessed proudly to this kind of foresight. He had been elaborating dangers and defences, expecting the worst, rehearsing his best. He must have led a most exalted existence. Can you fancy it? A succession of adventures— so much glory, such a victorious progress, and the deep sense of his sagacity crowning every day of his inner life. He forgot himself, his eyes shone, and with every word my heart, searched by the light of his absurdity, was growing heavier in my breast. I had no mind to laugh, and, lest I should smile, I made for myself a stolid face. He gave signs of irritation. It is always the unexpected that happens, I said in a propitiatory tone. My obtuseness provoked him into a contemptuous pshaw. I suppose he meant that the unexpected couldn't touch him. Nothing less than the unconceivable itself could get over his perfect state of preparation. He had been taken unawares, and he whispered to himself a malediction upon the waters and the firmament, upon the ship, upon the men. Everything had betrayed him. He had been tricked into that sort of high-minded resignation which prevented him from lifting as much as his little finger, while these others, who had a very clear perception of the actual necessity, were tumbling against each other and sweating desperately over that boat business. 
Something had gone wrong there at the last moment. It appears that in their flurry they had contrived in some mysterious way to get the sliding bolt of the foremost boat chalk jammed tight, and forthwith had gone out of the remnants of their minds over the deadly nature of that accident. It must have been a pretty sight, the fierce industry of these beggars toiling on a motionless ship that floated quietly in the silence of a world asleep, fighting against time for the freeing of that boat, groveling on all fours, standing up in despair, tugging, pushing, snarling at each other venomously, ready to kill, ready to weep, and only kept from flying at each other's throats by the fear of death that stood silent behind them like an inflexible and cold-eyed taskmaster. <laughs> oh, yes! It must have been a pretty sight. He saw it all. He could talk about it with scorn and bitterness. He had a minute knowledge of it by means of some sixth sense, I conclude, because he swore to me he had remained apart without a glance at them and at the boat, without one single glance. And I believe him. I should think he was too busy watching the threatening slant of the ship, the suspended menace discovered in the midst of the most perfect security, fascinated by the sword hanging by a hair over his imaginative head. Nothing in the world moved before his eyes, and he could depict to himself without hindrance the sudden swing upward of the dark skyline, the sudden tilt up of the vast plain of the sea, the swift still rise, the brutal fling, the grasp of the abyss, the struggle without hope, the starlight closing over his head forever like the vault of a tomb, the revolt of his young life, the black end. He could. By Jove, who couldn't? And you must remember he was a finished artist in that peculiar way. He was a gifted poor devil with the faculty of swift and forestalling vision. The sights it showed him had turned him into cold stone from the soles of his feet to the nape of his neck. Uh, but there was a hot dance of thoughts in his head, a dance of lame, blind, mute thoughts, a whirl of awful cripples. Didn't I tell you he confessed himself before me as though I had the power to bind and to loose? He burrowed deep, deep, in the hope of my absolution, which would have been of no good to him. This was one of those cases which no solemn deception can palliate, where no man can help, where his very maker seems to abandon a sinner to his own devices." He stood on the starboard side of the bridge, as far as he could get from the struggle for the boat, which went on with the agitation of madness and the stealthiness of a conspiracy. The two Malays had, meantime, remained holding to the wheel. Just picture to yourselves the actors in that, thank God, unique episode of the sea, four beside themselves with fierce and secret exertions, and three looking on in complete immobility over the awnings covering the profound ignorance of hundreds of human beings, with their weariness, with their dreams, with their hopes arrested, held by an invisible hand on the brink of annihilation. For that they were so makes no doubt to me. Given the state of the ship, this was the deadliest possible description of accident that could happen. These beggars by the boat had every reason to go distracted with funk, Frankly, had I been there, I would not have given as much as a counterfeit farthing for the ship's chance to keep above water to the end of each successive second. And still she floated. These sleeping pilgrims were destined to accomplish their whole pilgrimage to the bitterness of some other end. It was as if the omnipotence whose mercy, they confessed, had needed their humble testimony on earth for a while longer and had looked down to make a sign, Thou shalt not, to the ocean. Their escape would trouble me as a prodigiously inexplicable event, did I not know how tough old iron can be. As tough sometimes as the spirit of some men we meet now and then, worn to a shadow and breasting the weight of life. Not the least wonder of these twenty minutes, to my mind, is the behavior of the two helmsmen. They were amongst the native batch of all sorts brought over from Aden to give evidence at the inquiry. 
One of them, laboring under intense bashfulness, was very young, and with his smooth, yellow, cheery countenance, looked even younger than he was. I remember perfectly Briarly asking him, through the interpreter, what he thought of it at the time, and the interpreter, after a short colloquy, turning to the court with an important air, he says he thought nothing. The other, with patient, blinking eyes, a blue cotton handkerchief faded with much washing, bound with a smart twist over a lot of grey wisps, his face shrunk into grim hollows, his brown skin made darker by a mesh of wrinkles, explained that he had a knowledge of some evil thing befalling the ship, but there had been no order. He could not remember an order. Why should he leave the helm? To some further questions he jerked back his spare shoulders, and declared it never came into his mind then that the white men were about to leave the ship through fear of death. He did not believe it now. There might have been secret reasons. He wagged his old chin knowingly. Aha! Secret reasons. He was a man of great experience, and he wanted that white tuan to know, he turned toward Briarly, who didn't raise his head, that he had acquired a knowledge of many things by serving white men on the sea for a great number of years. And suddenly, with shaky excitement, he poured upon our spellbound attention a lot of queer-sounding names, names of dead-and-gone skippers, names of forgotten country ships, names of familiar and distorted sound, as if the hand of dumb time had been at work on them for ages. They stopped him at last. A silence fell upon the court, a silence that remained unbroken for at least a minute, and passed gently into a deep murmur. This episode was the sensation of the second day's proceedings, affecting all the audience, affecting everybody except Jim, who was sitting moodily at the end of the first bench, and never looked up at this extraordinary and damning witness that seemed possessed of some mysterious theory of defense. So these two Lascars stuck to the helm of that ship without steerage way, where death would have found them if such had been their destiny. The whites did not give them half a glance, had probably forgotten their existence. Assuredly Jim did not remember it. He remembered he could do nothing. He could do nothing, now he was alone. There was nothing to do but stick with the ship. No use making a disturbance about it. Was there? He waited upstanding, without a sound, stiffened in the idea of some sort of heroic discretion. The first engineer ran cautiously across the bridge, to tug at his sleeve. "'Come and help! For God's sake, come and help!' He ran back to the boat on the points of his toes, and returned directly to worry at his sleeve, begging and cursing at the same time. "'I believe he would have kissed my hands!' said Jim savagely, and next moment he starts foaming and whispering in my face. If I had the time, I would like to crack your skull for you. I pushed him away. Suddenly he caught hold of me round the neck. Damn him! I hit him. I hit out without looking. Won't you save your own life, you infernal coward? He sobs. Coward! He called me an infernal coward. <laughs> he, he called me. <laughs> he had thrown himself back and was shaking with laughter. I had never in my life heard anything so bitter as that noise. It fell like a blight in all the merriment about donkeys, pyramids, bazaars, or what not. Along the whole dim length of the gallery the voices dropped. The pale blotches of faces turned our way with one accord, and the silence became so profound that the clear tinkle of a teaspoon falling on the tessellated floor of the veranda rang out like a tiny and silvery scream. "'You mustn't laugh like this, with all these people about,' I remonstrated. "'It isn't nice for them, you know.' He gave no sign of having heard at first, but after a while— with a stare that, missing me altogether, seemed to probe the heart of some awful vision, he muttered carelessly, 
No, they'll think I am drunk. And after that you would have thought from his appearance he would never make a sound again. But no fear. He could no more stop telling now than he could have stopped living by the mere exertion of his will. End of chapter 8